Okay. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to this webinar about ASME B31, Piping Systems for Industrial Plants. This webinar will be given by Javier Tirenti, a senior mechanical engineer with a master's in business administration. He has over 20 years experience in the design, calculation, and production of mechanical equipment, such as pressure vessels, heat exchangers, storage tanks, piping systems, and other structures in general. He has extensive experience teaching specialized training courses, both in person and online. Javier is also an ASME authorized instructor. During this webinar, we'll discuss the essential aspects that determine good development of piping systems. We'll mention the following topics, optimum diameter, main applicable codes for piping systems, wall thickness estimation, materials, joints, flexibility, Autumn, you're on mute. Sorry to interrupt you. You're on mute. Yeah, accidentally it is on mute. I don't know at what point I was on mute, but... Um... Yeah, it is not a problem. You were just mentioning uh, these essential aspects of uh, pipe okay. development. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Um, so the things that we're going to discuss in the webinar will be the aspects that determine good development of piping systems, mentioning the following topics optimum diameter, main applicable codes for piping systems, wall thickness estimation, materials, joints, flexibility, and supportability. We do remind you that the webinar will be recorded and that as of tomorrow, it will be available on our YouTube channel, Arvang Training and Engineering. Also at the end of the presentation, we'll have a Q&A session where you can ask Javier the questions that you have either through the chat or you can use the hand raise feature in teams and uh, ask it directly all right so now it's time to begin i'll pass things over to javier javier good afternoon good afternoon autumn thank you so much for this uh, kind introduction Fantastic. hello to everyone that's here so you are passing the with the witness to me so i can yep. i can start fantastic okay Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for this uh, beautiful introduction. So good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody, depending on uh, which part of the world you are joining in today. It is our pleasure to be hosting this webinar and uh, to be um, gathering so many people and uh, yeah, getting your attention for this for these minutes and for this probably uh, half an hour, 45 minutes, that is going to be the length of this webinar. Um, we are conducting a series of webinars aimed at answering the, let's say, most, most asked questions regarding uh, design of mechanical equipment piping systems, static equipment, rotating equipment, and so on and so forth. In this case, we are going to be uh, discussing about ASME B31. And the ones that uh, have participated in, uh, in, in previous sessions, you all know that uh, the way that we approach these webinars is in, in a series, answering a series a series of questions, questions that are very frequently asked. And we think that in this way, answering by answering questions, um, the most important topics are addressed. And at the same time, these questions uh, usually trigger some other ones. So by all means, um, feel free to raise your questions at the end of this, uh, of this webinar. So without further to do, let's start with the first question that we have identified as um, one of the most uh, important ones. Um, how is the ASME B31 organized? Well, we all know that there are several piping systems design codes. Uh, for example, the Chinese piping systems design code or the European. Uh, design code in this case would be the EN 13 480. 
under is the ASME B31 code. Um, the, the ASME B31 code is divided in different sections, sections that are addressing different types of plants, uh, different sectors. For example, the for example, the B311 power piping or B313 process piping or B3112 hydrogen piping and pipelines. So let's go a little bit deeper and explore some of the most well-known sections within the ASME B31. And we can start with 31.1. Um, this is a design code that is aimed at um, designing piping systems for electric power plants mainly, or power generation systems, or geothermal heating systems. Then we can move to B313, uh, in which case we are going to be um, speaking about designing piping systems for oil or paper or textile refineries or petrochemical plants. And talking about downstream, we are going to be designing or let's say that this code is aimed uh, or within the scope of this code, uh, we are going to be able to design piping systems for uh, petrochemical plants, of course, only downstream. Okay, moving on to B31.4. Um, in this case, the scope uh, that we're going to find there, it is for the transportation of liquid hydrocarbons uh, outside the limits of a refinery, uh, which means this is upstream. In the same, uh, in the same line, we are going to find, we can discuss about uh, B31.8, it is for gas transportation within the scope of this code. We are going to find, um, uh, we're going to be able to design piping systems for uh, gas transportation, always outside battery limits of a refinery, which means upstream. So this is just a glance of four of the main sections within the ASME B31 code. Uh, just for us to uh, have a, an understanding of what, what we can find there. Okay, let's move on to the second questions. To, to the second question. Are there any related codes or specifications that complement uh, the, the ASME B31 code or 31 codes? Well, actually, the question should be the, the question shouldn't be are there any related codes or specifications? The question should be how many related codes or specifications? Because as we all know, we are going to find we are always with these codes, we are always going to find several uh, related uh, codes and specifications. So um, in this case, of course, as you may be aware, um, there are several codes and specifications that are um, needed uh, within the ASME B31 code in, in order to uh, arrive to an adequate design and to, com to complete the requirements that are listed and indicated in the codes themselves. So, uh, in the one hand, we have the different codes themselves, B31, 313, 311, 313, 314, or 318, as we previously discussed. And these codes are um, the ones that are going to be dictating and uh, listing all the requirements that are going to be applicable for the design of the different piping systems within the different sectors. But these codes are not alone uh, in are not going to be alone. We are not going to find only the codes themselves, but also some standards that are identified and are um, referenced in the different codes, such as uh, standards such as the ASME B165, for example, for uh, 
um, the selection of flanges up to 24 inches and in NPS, uh, 24 inches included NPS, or we can find 16.9 uh, or 16.47 or 36.10 for the selection of carbon steel and low alloy um, pipes, commercial pipes for piping systems. So besides the design codes, we're going to find standards. At the same time, we're going to have to be dealing with material designations and the selection of different materials for our piping systems. In this case, I am referring to AS ASTM materials, which uh, need to be selected in order to um, be working or applied to our the pipes that we have previously selected in the step, uh, the, the previous step, as I was mentioning. So we have design codes, we have standards that are going to go along are going to go along uh, along uh, the design codes. We have materials that are going to be needed as, at the same time in order to define the different elements and components of a piping systems. And there are also some other standards or specifications that might be applicable, such as AP, um, API um, 5L, for example, for pipes, commercial pipes, or uh, API 6D or 600, some other uh, specifications or standards from other organizations such as the American Petroleum Institute uh, that in this case are completely uh, accepted and are referenced in the, um, in the body of the design codes themselves. So as you can see there are several references that need to be um, identified and um, checked prior the development of any design. But to complicate things uh, a little bit further, there are also some other standards from the M MSSSP organization or some other, let's say, um, norms or specifications from uh, AWS in terms of welding, for example, as you can uh, uh, as you can anticipate, this is not going to be an easy task. Um, putting everything, all these uh, codes, specifications, standards, norms, putting everything together, shaking it up, and getting the end result that is uh, a unique document that contains all the requirements for the design of piping systems. That is not a straightforward nor an easy task. So it is something that we need to dedicate uh, and allocate some time at the beginning of each project in order to understand what the requirements of all these uh, documents uh, are and then produce um, a, a, a document containing the design criteria for a specific project that is a must that that is almost a must in, in every single project in order to understand and to have all the requirements in one single document. Uh, in, in order to simplify the selection of different components, I wanted to bring to this uh, session this diagram, which is mm, nothing in terms of uh, a piping system, it is nothing. It is just a bunch of different components joined together and they are related, let's say, or the different components have an identification of which standard needs to be used in terms of selecting the or using the right standard for the selection of, of that component. For example, if we focus on this section, we are going to see that, for example, if we want to select this pipe, we would have to go to um, if the pipe is made out made out, out of uh, carbon steel, we have to go to B36.10, and if the pipe that we are trying to select it is made out of uh, stainless steel, we have to go to 
B36.19. So this, uh, let's say, uh, this sketch, this diagram that we are seeing on the screen, it is just a shortcut for us to have a better understanding of which standards to use in order to select which component. We are going to find all, almost every single component in, in, in a simple um, piping system. You can find valves, you can find um, socket weld and threaded components, you can find uh, larger flanges, larger than 24 inches flanges, and so on and so forth. Okay, fantastic. Let's move on to the next topic. How to select materials for different fluids as per ASME B31? Well, I, I'm always avoiding bringing bad news to a class or to a session like this one, but in this case, probably I have to bring a little bit bad news. That, I mean, I'm just uh, uh, obviously uh, making a little bit of a joke with this because I am sure that most of you are aware that codes do not suggest or recommend uh, any specific material designation for any specific application. So with that in mind, um, all that codes do, it is just they, they merely state and list the permitted materials and requirements within um, and a specific code. So there's just going to be a list of permitted materials, but there is not going to be any suggestion or shortcut as to which material to use for hydrogen or water transportation or um, uh, highly corrosive fluids. So, there is no shortcut for that in terms of material selection, uh, or let's say at least um, within the code. In order to do that, we need to check uh, best practices, lesson learned, or uh, client or job specifications. For example, refineries, uh, Shell, Exxon, Saudi Aramco, or any other big oil producer in the world, they do know their business and obviously they uh, have very strong and stringent specifications when it comes to material selections, for example. So in that case, if we are working in a project for one of these companies or any other for that matter, all we need to do is just check the job specification in order to see if there are any materials material requirements or material selection uh, criteria that we can uh, that we can use or uh, further evaluate for that project. Uh, at the same time, we, we there are also uh, a number of publications uh, in terms of uh, damage mechanisms or corrosion allowances for different materials and fluids. So in that case, um, those publications need to be checked. For example, API RP 571, that is, um, let's say, by default, um, the document to go to uh, in order to understand the damage mechanisms and to start the, or to, to make the first steps uh, in, in order to make a material selection, material material selection to for for a, for a specific project. So RP um, API RP recommended practice five seven one in, in that specification, we are going to find all the um, damage mechanisms, sulfidation, wet H two S creep, oxidation, thermal fatigue, um, graphitization. Um, thermal shock, steam blanketing, soil corrosion, and we could be speaking for one year non-stop, 24-7, uh, 365, uh, about damage mechanisms. But that is a, a different topic for another session. In this case, we're just 
uh, referencing this great document. OK, let's move on to the next question. How to define the corrosion allowance of a system? What is the meaning of CA three millimeters or CA three mils? Well, I am sure that everybody here knows about CA three millimeters, corrosion allowance, three mils. But the question should be how this is defined. Well, the corrosion allowance is defined as the annual corrosion rate of a piping system and multiplied by the service life in years. So the annual corrosion rate uh, it is going to be obtained through experience, uh, through um, laboratory tests, or um, it could be obtained, for example, from similar services. If we are working in, in a refinery and we do not know the annual corrosion rate of a specific line, but uh, we do know the corrosion rate of a very similar line that is um, at hand or which we have, for which we have the records of that line. So that is also acceptable. If we multiply that annual corrosion rate in meals per year or any other, um, any other, let's say, uh, unit that we may be using and we multiply by the service year, the, the, the service life of that piping system or equipment in years, we're going to obtain the uh, corrosion allowance that we need to apply to that system. And maybe some of you may be wondering, how on earth am I going to know the service life of a piping system? Well, it is something that you should ask the owner of the project that you are working for or the plant you are working for. But normally the service life of a piping system, depending on the industrial sector we are working on, could go from 20 to 30 years in total. So there you have a reference in terms of understanding um, the, 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 let's say the, the basics of uh, corrosion allowance. And this annual corrosion rate, as I, as I was saying before, it could be obtained from good practices, lesson learn, lessons learned, or from similar lines. But if none of the previews is available, we can always res uh, we can always resort to to different publications. For example, uh, the one from the NACE, Corrosion Engineers Reference Book, and from there we can obtain um, estimated um, annual corrosion rate for different uh, pairs of materials and fluid. For example, uh, we are seeing here um, a chart to establish the annual corrosion rate of carbon steel and sulfuric acid, for example because I decided to bring this chart uh, to the screen, but we could be dealing with any material. Well, not any, but most of the materials that we have to deal with on a daily basis. And then uh, any, almost any fluids that we have to work with uh, in the different projects. So this chart is going to indicate, depending on the different curves that we are evaluating, it could identify what is going to what is going to be the corrosion rate for this specific pair of uh, material for on the one hand and uh, fluid on the other hand. And obviously that the temperature is going to be a factor as well that needs to be acknowledged. And then the in this case, the content, the weight content um, of sulfuric acid of that fluid. Uh, that being said, we are going to obtain uh, an annual corrosion rate. For example, we can see there 50, um, 50 MPY. MPY, these are micro inches per year. So if you need to use uh, metric units, you just translate or convert um, Micro, micro inches per year to mils per year, and then and there you go. You have the annual corrosion rate for that combination. And this is just an example, of course, that uh, 
uh, it would be too much of a coincidence if you you would need to use or to, you would need to know the this uh, corrosion rate of of this material and this fluid. But this is just an example of what you can achieve or you can expect um, with this type of references. Excellent. Let's move to the next one. Are there any differences between materials for piping systems and pressure vessels? Well, this is a very, very common and uh, frequent question because we need to we, we need to be clear about the ASME committees. There are several committees that take care or uh, develop different areas. On the one hand, we have the Boilers and Pressure Vessels Committee, which is going to obviously deal with boilers and pressure vessels. In this case, materials are selected as per ASME Section 2, Boilers and Pressure Vessels Code Section 2. On the other hand, we can find we are going to find B31 Piping Systems Committee. In this case, obviously, the aim of this committee is the design of piping systems, and the materials are going to be defined as per ASTM uh, volumes. The American Steel uh, and Testing Materials, uh, the American Society for Testing and Materials, sorry, um, in different volumes is going to uh, or we're going to find um, materials listed uh, first materials non ferrous materials and um, for different components for us to work with in the design of piping systems and let's dig a little bit more uh, in this um, or let's say in the differences of these two organizations or or in the materials produced on the material designations or requirements produced by these two organizations. On the one hand, we have ASME, American Society of Mechanical Engineers, uh, or in the other hand, we have the ASTM, the American Society for Testing and Materials. In one case, materials are going to be designated um, as SA106, for example, for um, carbon, uh, a carbon steel pipe. If we go to ASTM, we're going to find that materials are designated as A106 for the same pipe and the same material. That is the uh, difference between these two committees. But let's go to what matters. And let's try to understand if there are any differences in these two materials, for example. Well, as you can see on the screen, um, I am showing the um, heading of the specification. On top, we see ASTM, the material designations, material designation that is used for piping systems. And at the bottom, we can see ASME, but in this case, ASME is using the all the requirements and the same specification that is coming from ASTM. So in this case, there is no difference whatsoever between ASME and ASTM. Actually, there is a note there that is saying identical with ASTM specification. So for this specific material, there is no difference whatsoever between two uh, material designations. This is not going to be the case for 100% of the materials uh, between pressure vessels and piping systems, but a large percentage of material designations are going to be the same. Um, in other words, AS, ASME um, has inherited, um, let's say, material specifications from ASTM. For, for, from ASTM. So um, a very good percentage of specifications, there is not going to be any difference. But there are some exceptions where we are going to have 
um, careful. We're going we're gonna to have to be wary of that uh, we could find some minor differences uh, there um, between the two designations. OK, good. Let's move on to the main variables involved in the wall thicknesses uh, in the wall thickness calculation of a pipe under internal pressure. What are the main variables involved in the wall thickness calculation of a pipe under internal pressure? Well, if we wanted to go to the detail of every single piping code, be 31 or 31.1, 31.3 or 31.4, 31.8, we would have to discuss that specific uh, that specific code and the specific set of set of set of variables applicable to that code. But it is not the aim of this session. So, for instance, for example, we are going to work with B313 and we're just going to understand which ones are the main variables involved in this calculation. Well, thickness, it is going to be direct, directly proportional to the pressure, the design pressure, so higher pressure, higher thickness required. Very straightforward. Diameter, outside diameter of the pipe. So the thickness is going to uh, be directly proportional to the outside diameter of the pipe. What do we find in the bottom part of the of the equation? Well, we find S, which is the allowable stress of the material that we are going to find tabulated in different tables, um, such as table A1 for the code B313. The allowable stress is the design mechanical property of the material that we're going to be using in terms of or in order to define the thickness required of our piping system. Moving on, we find E, that is the joint efficiency. The joint efficiency in terms of, or let's say, um, in this case, we are talking about the longitudinal joint efficiency of the pipe. So if we decide to use a welded pipe, we have to go to the pipe specification and we have to see if that weld, uh, which is the joint efficiency of that longitudinal weld for that pipe. If in turn uh, we use a seamless pipe, that is not that there is no seam and there is no weld in that pipe. Of course, that the joint efficiency in that case is going to be uh, one. So seamless equals E one. What else do we have? Well, we have a coefficient, a coefficient here, coefficients, coefficient uh, W. That is this coefficient it is a reduction factor. Um, to account for temperature, so up to 100, uh, up to 510 Celsius degrees, the coefficient is one. If you go further, or if you, if you go higher in temperature, you have to use um, different coefficients, as you can see on the screen. Then we have the pressure again, and a coefficient that is again related to the temperature. In this case, it's dimensionless, and you have to go to table 304.11 in this case. Anyway, the most important uh, variables involved in the thickness calculation, pressure, diameter, um, allowable stress, and joint efficiency. Those four variables um, are the most important ones. It's pretty, uh, pretty straightforward, as, as you can see. OK, let's uh, continue. This is a question that it, it, it could be, let's say, um, easy to understand or very logical to to identify why it is important that piping systems have enough flexibility. But more often than not, we get involved in different projects where we see ourselves uh, in the situation of explaining this 
and again and again. And why? Because um, sometimes the concept of that the temperature is making piping or pipes move, uh, it is not very, very easy to understand. These systems, as we can, as we have seen on that animation on the screen, systems are alive. Piping systems are alive. They are moving. Um, in, in, in an industrial plant, whenever we go there, everything, or let's say at least piping, seems to be uh, steel and static, but they move. And when do they move? Well, they move due to thermal expansion. When they are subjected to a thermal gradient, gradient uh, they move, they expand, and that expansion needs to be uh, controlled, of course, and it needs to be taken care of. That expansion, the piping thermal expansion, as you may remember from uh, uni or um, from actually your college, metals expand. Well, we are not going to explain the equation for piping thermal expansion here, but that expansion needs to be um, it needs to be taken care of. And, and why is that? Well, it needs to be taken care of because if a pipe, it is subjected to a thermal gradient and somehow the pipe cannot move, cannot expand because of supports or because of the restraints of the system, there is going to be a force that is going to be induced in that pipe. And that force, it is what we are seeing on, on screen. Uh, again, <laughs> this is not the, um, let's say, the, the moment to be explaining stress and strain uh, and Hooke's law. Uh, by the way, it's something that is very basic and I am sure you all know, but the, if we do some, uh, um, if, if we replace the those equa equations and we try to isolate the force that is induced uh, in a pipe that is trying to expand, but due to the restraints of the system cannot do it, there is going to be a force that is going to be induced in that pipe. And that force, it is what we see on the screen. And believe me, that force is huge. Uh, the induced force is huge when a tr when a pipe tries tries to expand and uh, due to the re restraints uh, it cannot do so. Uh, the the force that could that we can see at the ends of that pipe uh, are going to be incredibly incredibly high. That is why we need to control and we need to take care of the expansions. And how do we? take care of the thermal expansions of the pipe? Well, by increasing flexibility uh, in the piping system. So how to confer or how to increase the flexibility uh, to a piping system? Well, there are several ways to increase piping flexibility. One of them would be to add an expansion loop. If we change the, direct, change the direction of the um, of the routing of the line by adding expansion loops, we are uh, increasing the flexibility of that system. Another alternative could be uh, to um, relocate the equipment if possible, which is not going to be possible uh, many, many times, but changing the direction of the, uh, of, of the line, changing the routing of the line and adding elbows, it is going to increase, obviously, the flexibility of that system. So that is another way. Another way could be to use expansion joints. These are mechanical devices, um, coaxial mechanical devices that absorb axial movement in, in, in a piping system. In some cases, we're going to be able, able to use them. Um, due to the restrictions in terms of pressure and temperature that these mechanical devices present. And in some of the cases, unfortunately, these devices are not going to be um, usable 
for specific piping systems. And the the last um, the last alternative it would be a combination of the above, combining loops with expansion joints and changes changes in direction of the piping systems. Uh, that 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 is going to bring more uh, flexibility that is going to increase even more the flexibility of the system. So, in a nutshell, that is what we wanted to share with you today. Um, those are uh, the, some questions that we wanted to share and, and the answers, um, how we uh, wanted to this, this webinar to uh, be uh, in terms of what to cover, and I, I think um, it is a very uh, broad spectrum that we've covered, and I hope this triggers some additional questions, and I hope that this has been useful for you. So, uh, are there any further questions, Autumn? Well, I just want to say thank you for the presentation, Javier, and just before we begin the question and answer session, um, just want to invite everyone to check out our website um, so you can see all the courses that we have available, um, including the ASME B31 course, if you'd like to go deeper into the topic. Um, so um, also the links in the chat. So if anyone has some questions, you can put them either in the chat or there's a hand raise feature on Teams that you can use um, to now would be the time to ask those questions. <laughs> uh, if anyone has one, just let me know in the chat and I'll pass it on. Or you can ask directly to Javier's the hand raise feature. And in the meantime, I did get a question by email that was asking about. Sorry, maybe I'm not sure if you could hear me because I have my microphone there. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I, I didn't want I didn't want to interrupt you. We <laughs> we could hear you. We could hear More you. Or less no, you worries could hear. At, no worries at no worries <laughs> at all. But now it is better. Okay, great. Um, okay, there's a question that came through the chat that's about a hydrostatic test, ASME BPVC section. Section 8, Division 1 specifies hydrostatic pressure test as 1.3 times of MAWP times stress ratio, whereas ASME B31 specifies it as 1.5 times. That why is it what's the difference between 1.5 and 1.3? Very good question. Very, very good question. Um the difference, the, the, the difference mainly. Uh, lies on the uh, design factors of the codes. Um, a ASME Section 8 Division 1 for pressure vessels, it is a little bit more stringent in terms of the different components that form a pressure vessel. Um, as we all know, a pressure vessel is a tailor-made equipment. So um, in, the, in that case, bearing in mind that we are dealing with a tailor-made equipment, there are several different components that need to be um, tested in different in the, uh, different conditions. So that being said, uh, piping systems um, use a, a, a slightly higher um, coefficient in terms of the pressure testing and pressure vessels are a slightly lesser coefficient, 1.3 uh, versus 1.5. It is just um, the design factors that are within the the different codes. That is the answer. Okay, thank you. We have another question um, that says, any reference for CA for different fluid types? like H2S, salty water, oily water, etc. Very good question, very good question. As I was mentioning before, um, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen so we can see, you can see us um, a little bit larger on screen. Um, as I was saying before, material selection, it is, 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 is a whole subject on its own. Um, it is not covered by the code. It is not, uh, there are not any suggestions. So any reference material, well, by far the best reference that you can get are the 
um, NACE guides, the, the NACE reference books. There are several volumes, several books that you need to check, but that is by far the best reference you can get. Um, second, a very good reference is, is going to be the uh, job specifications for uh, the different projects that you're, go you're going to be dealing with or the different um, players in the oil and gas sector. I am assuming you are in the oil and gas sector, but if you are in a different sector, you can translate what I'm saying to that specific sector, but the different players, as I say, as I was saying before, such as Exxon or Shell or any other, you can. Um, that is a very good rep reference point for you to go ahead and understand material selection. And there are also there are many, many, many books uh, as well that deal with this, but those two probably are, are my favorite. OK, cool. We have another question from Isaac. What is the minimum thickness required for PWHT in piping systems according to the latest version of ASME B31.3? Before it was 19 millimeters, but I don't know if it's changed with the newest versions. And he says, thank you very much for this webinar, Javier. Thank you so much for raising that question, Isaac. Um, a very good question. Um, 99%, 99%, I am 99% sure that the, that requirement, that requirement remains the same. Um, but I'm going to have to go back on that one in order to check if in, uh, a 20, 2022 edition of B31.3, um, is saying anything, anything different to the best of my knowledge right now. It is not saying anything different, but I'm going to have to come back to you on that one. So we're going to post this on our um, YouTube page, YouTube channel, and um, we, we can we can indicate the answer to that one there. Or if if you are so kind, Isaac, you can you can send us you can drop us uh, a question through the email and we are going to come back to that one on, on, on uh, as, as soon as possible. Yeah, I, I put the email address in the chat. So if anyone has um, questions after the fact, um, you can write us there. And there is another question from Anwar. Is it allowed to reduce to CA after service when you find metal loss instead of re-rating? Sorry, can you say that again, please? Ah, okay, it is allowed to reduce CA. Um, okay, sorry, um, no problem. Uh, Corrosion allowance um, and re-rating and fitness for service, that is a whole different ballgame. We are talking about API 579. Uh, we are talking about ASME B31G, for example, or any other fitness for service codes. So um, it is allowed to reduce the corrosion allowance after in service, but in order to do so, you have to go and perform uh, a fitness for service evaluation uh, or assessment, I would say, following the specific words used in, in those codes that I mentioned, API 579. And in order to do so, you have to double check the design conditions. You have to um, go over an assessment that could be, could be quite extensive depending on if the corrosion is localized or is a general or uniform corrosion that is pre uh, that is present on the on the piping system and so on and so forth so can be done yes it can be done but it needs an assessment a fitness for surface assessment and it is a very interesting question because here today we are talking about design code b31 but that question is uh or belongs to a, another seminar that we're going to be conducting uh, sooner or later. Let's hope that it is the sooner and it's going to be API 579. Okay, thank you. Um, we also have another question. We've got a lot of questions Great. today. Fantastic. Um, 
he first says, thank you for the web, the excellent webinar. And he has a question. Does ASME B31 code specify any time interval for rectification tests, such as repeat hydrostatic pressure tests of the pipelines designed per these codes? Very good question. Actually, I think, um, sorry, sorry to um, correct you or say this, but I think that the person that was saying thank you for this webinar um, was Anwar. And then the question comes from Jay Vishru, if I am pronouncing this properly. But anyway, it is, uh, it, it doesn't matter, uh, Autumn. So very good question, Jay. Um, I'm saying Jay because it is a little bit straightforward, more straightforward for me than answering or pronouncing your last name. Um, that is, um, as I was saying, very, very good question. Uh, that belongs to the category of uh, fitness for service. Once the piping system is designed, designed, fabricated, and um, received in terms of mechanical completion, the design code ends there. Once the piping is in operation, the design codes, the design code, it is not longer applicable there. Why? Because the system is under operation. So we have to go to, we have to perform an assessment, uh, a fitness, fitness for assessment, uh, for fitness for service assessment, and that is as per API 579. So um, B31 is not going to be specifying the time interval for recertification. In that case, you're going to have to go to API 579, or you're going to have to go and check in API 570 that it is um, a code for inspection, um, modification, alteration, recertification, and um, re-rating if needed. So answering your question in short, it would be um, API 570. And yes, the interval is indicated there. Okay, um, and where it says regulation may also request rehydro test. <laughs> very, very good point. Uh, Anwar, thank you so much for complimenting, complimenting my answer. Absolutely, the local regulation um, could also require, uh, uh, let's say, um, a recertification in, test, in terms of hydro test or rehydro test. So, very good addition. Uh, well, I think um, that's all the questions in the chat. Did anyone else have any last questions before we close out? I think that's about it, Javier. Um, that's about it. Okay. <laughs> so let, let me, they're let saying me one hour is not enough, <laughs> which uh, I think is uh, is true. But that's why hopefully you can uh, check out the course because it goes further in depth into yes, the topic. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, we know we know that one hour is it's not enough. We try to. We, we, we try to bring this humble knowledge to you as much as we can, but as we, you all know, um, time is tight for everybody. Uh, schedules are very, very tight, but anyway, always a pleasure. And I, 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 wa I wanted to take the opportunity to thank you all for attending to this webinar. It is always a pleasure for us to, to see so many people uh, in the webinar and um, Let's hope that uh, we can see in the next one. I know that Autumn has a very important message for you. Yeah, well, first of all, I wanted to thank everyone again for joining us um, and encourage you to have a look at our website. Again, we have a lot of courses available and we do have a course about ASME B31 because we know one hour is not enough to get into the topic in depth. Um, but hopefully this was helpful. And also just to remind you that as of tomorrow, this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel. It's our bank training and engineering, the same name. So uh, we'll send out an email with the link once it's ready and you can check out our channel because we upload other, other things apart from the webinars um, that are useful resources for everyone in the industry. So. Thank you all for coming and we hope you have a nice rest of your day wherever you might be located and we hope to see you at our next webinar. Thank you so much everybody. Thanks for attending. See you. See you in the next one.
Okay, bye everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.